ESPN, celebrating 150 years of college football. Most important innovation in college football, the advent of the forward pass. Until then, it's basically rugby. Joe Namath, the man with a solid gold arm, hits Ray Perkins with a bullet pass. There's this ingenuity and innovation in football. When the game started, there were flexible rules. It was the Wild West. The trouble was, people were dying. Innovation born of desperation to make a change to win, but what innovation isn't born out of desperation? Nowhere have we worked longer or harder than in the design and construction of helmets. How can we make this game as safe as possible? You want to have your best players out there. If your best player is a freshman, why wouldn't you want to have them out there? He's running over people! Oh, you Herschel Walker! NCAA football kicks off today, a season that will end for the first time with a national championship playoff. And Clemson strengthens its grip on this championship game. We realize that innovation has made this one of the greatest games in the world. I just want to thank all of you for coming here on the anniversary of college football. 150 years and we're celebrating the game that means so much to all of us. I can't think of another sport that encourages as much civil and sometimes not so civil discussion and debate and discourse <laughs> as college football. I'm hoping most of this will be civil, but if you want to get uncivil every now and then, that might make it fun. So I want you guys to think of us as a jury. And since there are 11 of us, let's come up with top 11 and a number of categories. So there have been a lot of innovations over the last 150 years that changed the game we love. So what about the best 11 innovations in college football? If you think about our innovations throughout time, if we're talking about on the field, going at it, I do think two platoon football has been the biggest innovation. One platoon meant everyone played both ways. So the entire game was 60 minutes, 11 guys going at each other. You had to play both offense and you had to play defense. You know, if you were a 300 pound guy, you would not be able to play 60 minutes. You'd be gassed. Until World War II, the substitution rule was you could only substitute at the quarter or in the case of a serious injury. In 1941, before Pearl Harbor, knowing that these guys are probably gonna be going off to World War II at some point, they changed the rule quietly that you can now substitute at any time. After the war, some coaches figured out, whoa, there are strategic advantages here. And so they started developing true two platoon football in like 1947, 48. But there was so much concern about that, you know, losing the Iron Man stamina that it took to play. In 1953, two platoon football was outlawed again. And so one platoons came back. Two platoons did not officially come back permanently until 1965. Now you can concentrate on just being a quarterback, just your passing ability. Where before, you also had to play defense. You had to be a safety. It also allowed specialization with the kicking game. Let's go! That really revolutionized the game was the advent of two platoon football. College football kind of started as like almost a rugby scrum with people really tightened in. There was really no lines of demarcation between the two teams. So the idea of a line of scrimmage was sort of to set the field and, and to set the ability of the two teams to go at one another to where you could follow the game as a spectator. There's so much chaos and it at least keeps some semblance of organization. The line of scrimmage kind of defines the battle line, so to speak, without it. It would be pretty hectic. Get another shot. Oh, a spectacular catch by Quinton Powers! Players' equipment has also made some drastic changes since the beginning of football. A far cry from the good old days when football players wore a bonnet of this description. The modern helmet today is light years different from what it was initially. Early on, most people really didn't wear helmets. When you finally did start having helmets, they offered very little protection. We developed a leather helmet, and the leather helmet did absolutely nothing. A leather helmet will not stop you getting a concussion. 
the first really revolutionary aspect of helmet design was the suspension helmet. By having your head suspended away from the shell of the helmet, the shell would absorb all the blow. Nowhere have we worked longer or harder than in the design and construction of helmets. Because of what we've learned about brain injuries, the increasing research and spotlight on CTE, there's going to be evolution with the helmet to try and make that as safe as possible. I can't imagine football players today wearing what football players wore in the 1950s and surviving games. I think there would be a lot more severe injuries if players were wearing what they wore back then. In 1913, when Newt Rockney is a player, not a coach, Notre Dame comes to New York and they shock Army using a radical tactic called the forward pass. Most important rule change in college football, the advent of the forward pass, no question. Until then, it's basically rugby. And you're smash mouth football, it's too dangerous. It got the game away from just the big guys. Now speed matters, it adds speed and skill. Stewart lets it go. He's got three people down there. Ball's up in the air, touchdown! The forward pass creates a dramatic moment in the game that really makes it a thousand times more dynamic and more gripping and more popular. Oh, I, I like three yards in the cloud of dust every now and then, but a forward pass is pretty cool. And that ball's floating in the air and picked up by Kendall Wright. Touchdown, Bears! So certainly the game has changed in a variety of ways. How do you not start with a forward pass? Well. <laughs> It has, it has to start there, right? And Notre Dame made it popular, but Pop Warner is the one who, who really changed the game. Well, I mean, Heather's right that Notre Dame popularized it when they upset <clears throat> Army. But the, the forward pass really came out of the 1905 trying to make football safer, and they were trying to spread, spread guys out. For the public. <laughs> Right. to see a guy throw a ball 30, 40, 50 yards down the yep. field and a guy gracefully leap up and catch it. I mean, that's athleticism and it's beauty and it started to catch on with other folks that it's worth seeing. For me, it's the line of scrimmage. And I don't know if it's because I'm a defensive oh, lineman. Okay. Uh, that's where you live. Possibly. <laughs> but I think the, the beauty of the game lies there because you look at, like, the structure of the game to be able to identify 11 on 11. We don't know football as we know it without the line of scrimmage. There are a number of reasons for rules changes. It can be to keep the game balanced, responses to offensive or defensive innovations. It can be to protect the players. It can be to make the game more exciting. What is it among the rules changes do you think has had the biggest impact on the game? Doctor, what are some of the other major projects to be discussed at the NCAA convention in Cincinnati? The council of the NCAA has forwarded to the football rules committee that it is quite evident that the majority of the colleges want some change. You think of college football and you think of the NCAA, and you might not have a positive impression of the NCAA, but it's created with noble intentions. When the game started, there were flexible rules. You had no regulation in terms of uh, physical safety, particular forms of play that were inherently more harmful to the body were being used routinely, and it, was, it wasn't causing injury, it was causing death. College presidents want to kill the sport, faculty does, but the students want to keep it going. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, of course, is a huge football fan, brings in Harvard, Yale, and Princeton to talk to him at the White House, and that is the genesis of the modern NCAA. At the end of the day, you need regulation. You need to have some basis by which the game is played. Personal foul, roughing the passer. Defense, number 15, 15-yard 15 penalty. And I do think that it protected the future of the game because it was, it was the Wild West. There are 10 seconds left in this battle. And it looks like that's all. It's one of those contests that makes you feel they ought to have an extra period in college football. In one of the great games of the era, the 1966 game of Michigan State and Notre Dame, the game ended in an unresolved finish. This game of the century did not have a winner. Can you imagine if that happened now? Seconds down to three. Going to go on top and incomplete, and we are heading to overtime. First time that it's happened, uh, the new NCAA rule. You want to have a winner. That's what we're trying to do in life, is win. 
If you're lucky enough in college football to get it into overtime. Ohio State wins! Oh my gosh, everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat and, and, and can hardly breathe. Touchdown! I think you just want to walk away satisfied and uh, ending in a tie is just whack. Got it! The Aggies win the game of the year! Official called a fumble down the goal line, but we didn't have instant replay. Had we had instant replay, we would have beaten them again and won another national championship, had another undefeated season. Barkley knocked out just short of the goal line. Thanks to touchdown. That ruling is under further review. He's going to go out of bounds, but before he touches, I think the ball breaks the plane. He's still in. Further review, the ruling on the field of touchdown stands. Since 2005, and since instant replay became a blanket policy across all of college football, for the most part, it's been a great innovation. The danger is becoming too reliant on it. You still want the officials on the field to make the call. We don't want to automatically go to the booth. But human error will always be a part of the game. Instant replay is never going to fix 100% of that, but it is going to help. After review, the runner stepped out of bounds at the nine yard line and not the six yard line. It will be first and goal, Mississippi State. Well, we've got a lot of good football players who seem very eager to play, even down to our freshmen. In the 1970s, they decided that, hey, we're going to make freshmen eligible. There's freshman Archie Griffin. What Rudy Hubbard and Coach Woody Hayes told me, uh, it was uh, good enough I could play. That meant a great deal to me, because that told me that they were going to look at my ability at that particular time. It took a while for it to change everything. You know, you didn't see a lot of freshmen playing in high profile positions. Well, he's running over people. Oh, you Herschel Walker. My God, a freshman. Now, of course, you see it all the time. Here comes Peyton Manning. Get used to it. You want to have your best players out there. If your best players are freshmen, why wouldn't you want to have them out there? Griffin is the leading rusher for both teams today. Now, true freshmen are leading their teams to national championships. Freshman eligibility. Once they made freshmen eligible, game on. Now all of a sudden, you've got people going to all corners of the earth trying to find this one kid who could turn it around next year, not waiting for a year, but who can do it right now. I totally agree, Bill. It's, it's literally the lifeblood of college football. Like you said, recruiting is freshman eligibility. Can I bring us back to the most important rule change ever? Overtime. Because oh I think yeah. we need winners and losers in college football, yes. right? Yes. yes. Yeah. We're not celebrating the ties, right? So I think that having a definitive I like winner the Oregon, Oregon is State the most important. Pie game. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. No, we see, want sitting, winners. We want winners. I want to make I want to make a broader case, unpopular, I'm sure, for the NCAA generally because they're responsible for. You know, these rule changes. It's like rooting for the IRS, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you talk about Teddy Roosevelt and calling them in and say, hey, form something for safety. Having a body to just pay attention to it, I think was a big deal. And, whether they and, get it right or wrong. Whether they get it right or yeah. wrong, just having something dedicated to trying to figure out ways to, to make it better. I, I'll, I'll say this, instant replay. The game is dramatically different now because of instant replay and how we even look back at old games, 1982, Stanford Cal, his knee was down. Here we go if, again. if we had instant replay then, you know, it's had a huge impact. Yeah, yeah. There are things in college football that not only have altered the way the game's played, uh, the culture of the game, coaching changes, the entire fan experience, and while the competition is always paramount, there is one thing that everyone should always remember. Yo, it's entertainment, sweetheart.
NCAA football kicks off today, a season that will end for the first time with a national championship playoff. Before the playoff, anyone could declare a national championship. There was never a clear definition about who was number one. It was all arguments and confusion. The college football playoff has made it so that there's far more awareness of what's really going on in the sport. It's easier to follow because of it. Are you getting into the top four? Once you're there, one's playing four, two's playing three, and then we play a championship game. It's emphatically better in every way than the BCS. Just like even the BCS was better than the old way, which was literally just like, all right, we finished, guys. Um, you're the best. Elliott! Touchdown, Ohio State! You know, whether it stays at four teams or goes to eight teams or 16 teams, the college football playoff is probably as close to perfect as we're going to get. The Alabama native wins the foot race and Clemson strengthens its grip on this championship game. Walter Camp's All-American team was probably the first conglomeration of here's where all the talent is across the country. We're going to put it all on one list. There may be some guy in Minnesota that you've never seen play because television doesn't exist, but he's really good. That probably helped turn college football into more of a national sport. Well, in the beginning, Camp saw every player personally, but football quickly outgrew this system. Your commentator makes his annual report. He's covered the biggest football games and shared the thrills of millions of fans. People nationally caught on to that, and other print and media outlets decided, you know what, why can't we do our own? It's all America time again, and telegrams are pouring in from Paramount News football cameramen across the nation. And ultimately created a, a television phenomenon with the Bob Hope All-America team. One of the highlights of our Christmas show has always been the introduction of the Associated Press All-America football team. Around the holidays, they would have this Bob Hope special, and Bob Hope would introduce every single college football All-American. Louis Oliver, Free Safety, University of Florida. Yep, Lewis is a polite football player. He always helps up the man he just tackled, or at least those parts of him that are nearby. I mean, I don't think young people can understand now how lucky they are to see all these games. That was the first and only time for many of us that we got to see those players live on television. There they are, the All-America team of 1988, ladies and gentlemen. Da -da -da -da. College football Saturday can't start until Lee Corso puts on the headgear. There is no point in teeing up a ball and kicking off until this happens. First time he ever did it, we were at Ohio State and there was about a couple hundred fans around us. He asked me, can you ask the cheerleading coach if I can wear Brutus the Buckeye headgear? So the next day we're sitting there and uh, now who do you pick? And I said, Whoa. boom. And the crowd went crazy. I said, I think I got a stick here. I think I'll do this again. Give me that shit. <laughs> 350 some times later, I'm making a living putting something in my head. When the show was over, and Lee Corso put the mascot head on, and people were going crazy in some form or fashion. That told the world, it's kickoff time. The day's about to start. Let's play football. A man who was meant for the entertainment business and being a college analyst on a college game day is not his calling. Meant for a bigger comedic and entertainment value was Lee Corso. I mean, he is the one part of college game day that is absolutely irreplaceable. The one question you get every week, who's he picking? Well, his, his headgear segment, great entertainment, but it's not just for the public view. I mean, players watch. Players care whether he's picked their team or not. Coaches watch, and it becomes the rallying cry, he didn't pick us. Does, does that make Lee, in some ways, a modern-day Walter Camp? Because mm. he, he gave the validation to the players with the early All-American team. And, and what a great name, you know, All-American. And it's taken on, it's an adjective on its own now that that means something special. It was amazing for a player to be a part of that All-American team and see the guys that came before you 
the pictures and the pageantry and, you know, people are lined up to see you walk in because Walter Camp All-Americans are like a big deal to them. It's, it's cool, man. It's cool. But the whole game exists to win the national championship, right? So what about the creation of the college football playoff? The college football playoff, to me, is... That's what I'm grateful for because yeah. I'm, I hated the BCS. I thought yeah. it was BS from the BCS. Why? Um, because it was computers and things we couldn't tangibly In touch. And, yeah, and I mean, ratings yeah. and ranking, and it was it was a cold computer fill, and I believe in a playoff system. I've seen it work. The fans liked it. We had real champions, and I think we've gotten closer to that in Division One. I. I love it. College football is where innovation occurs within the sport. Some out of necessity, and some just out of the freedom to experiment a little bit. Football is a conservative game, and yet it is the most progressive game because every new idea is worth attempting. We're in the entertainment business, and football is our vehicle. I love anything that's passion-based, and to me, college football is more passion-based than anything we have in American entertainment. Touchdown, Ohio State! The results are in, and these are the 11 greatest innovations from the first 150 years of college football. Boy, it looks like he's on the line. After review, the ruling on the field stands as called. Wow. It's a touchdown. Here's where all the talent is across the country. We're going to put it all on one list. Give me that shit! <laughs> and we are heading to overtime. First time that it's happened, uh, the new NCAA rule. Nowhere have we worked longer or harder than in the design and construction of helmets. You want to have your best players out there. If your best players are freshmen, why wouldn't you want to have them out there? You need to have some basis by which the game is played. The college football playoff has made it so that there's far more awareness of what's really going on in the sport. The line of scrimmage kind of defines the battle line, so to speak. Now you have more people with the opportunity to play. It's a better game. Stewart lets it go. He's got three people down there. Balls up in the air. Touchdown! The forward pass creates a dramatic moment in the game that really makes it a thousand times more dynamic and more gripping and more popular. There was a time where you'd have 25 guys on each side. I'm reading about this, and you mentioned rugby. Yes, absolutely rugby, but I'm There's also thinking no about There's no dirty stuff that goes on now. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. That's out of the game, except when I'm going against Larry Allen. It was the most questionable thing you ever did on the, oh, on the creative line of scrimmage. Kid, too hot for TV. Oh, come on. It's I'm just on. us. Statue of limitations. Did you ever bite no, someone? No, did you ever bite someone? No, I never bit anybody. I thought that was very unhygienic. Oh. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.